Over the past few years, lithium iron phosphate batteries have become extremely popular, especially for solar energy storage. Cells like this have a longer lifespan, up to 10 years, longer cycle life up to 4,000 times, a fairly stable level of voltage as the battery or cell is discharging, and lighter weight than lead acid batteries. All of those things come at a much higher cost. Right here you're looking at a cell that has a nominal voltage of 3.2 volts. The full charge voltage is 3.65 and the maximum discharge voltage would be down to 2.5 volts. 12 volt lithium iron phosphate batteries in the 100 amp range usually sell for between $800 and $1,000. When BLS Battery Industries, a company that's been around for almost 17 years, reached out to me and asked if I would like to test out their lithium iron phosphate cells, I took them up on their offer. The 120 amp hour cell that you see right here, I selected from their website. If you decided to purchase from this company, they do offer three to seven day free delivery. Many companies online have sprouted up to sell these lithium iron phosphate cells, and many of those companies either flat out lie about the ratings or grossly exaggerate the capacity ratings. I'll be performing some capacity tests to make sure the rating is what they say it is, measuring the temperature of the cell under high current discharge, and taking the four cells that were sent to me and making it into a 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery. As usual, just like my other videos, it makes no difference that this was sent to me. If I see something wrong, you're going to know about it. Four of these 120 amp hour cells, grade A, sell for $596 shipped. The weight for this cell is six and a quarter pounds or 2.86 kilograms. The entire case is aluminum, or if you're British, aluminium. And let's just spin this around. And you can see the very top of it. You have your two posts. Over here is your negative, and this is the positive. Cycle life, 4,000 cycles. Now the thing I wanna mention about the cycle life, it's pretty much impossible for me to test the cycle life for this cell or any other channel on YouTube, unless they're going to take the time to fully discharge this cell and recharge it several times a week for at least a year. And as you know, very few people are going to have the time to do that. So my big concern is the capacity rating for the cell. The maximum discharge rate for the cell is 120 amps, and you could do pulses up to 240 amps for 30 seconds. Discharge temperature range is minus 30C to 60C, and a charging range between minus 5C and 60C. Charging rate is up to 0.5C, which is 60 amps. According to the specifications, the internal resistance is between 0.2 and 0.3 milliohm. When you look at the case, you can see it's nice and flat, but it's not perfectly flat. There is an area on the center of each one of these cells where it's slightly convex, both sides. So when you put the cells together, they're not going to go super tight against each other. They're going to push together and you're going to have a very small space between. You can see between each one of these cells, there's a little bit of a space. Really should not make that much of a difference, but I just wanted to let you know that in case you decide to buy these. The first test I want to do is internal resistance. Unfortunately, my tester only goes down to one milliohm. So what I'm going to do is connect it up and just make sure that the value is very low between zero and one. And as you can see, the internal resistance is extremely low. It's between zero and one. I have the lithium iron phosphate cell fully charged up to 3.65 volts according to the manufacturer's specifications. The cell was only charged at a 10 amp rate, so it's nice and cool and it has been sitting for a half an hour. Over here with the electronic load, you can see I have output one and output two tied together there in parallel. And you can see the negative also, there's a plate on the bottom that connects to this side. The purpose of that the maximum current that I can do is only 20 amps per channel. So if I have 20 on channel one and 20 on channel two, we'll be pulling 40 amps off this battery 
and it's going to be done until the voltage drops to 2.5 volts, which is the maximum discharge voltage according to the manufacturer. You can see channel 1 right here, and channel 2, 20 amps, 2.5 volts is the cutoff voltage. Okay, let me connect this to the cell, and to do that I'm going to be using these pieces that came with the cell. It's a threaded stud, put it right in on top. Mm, that's pretty good. The wire that I'm using is 8 gauge stranded copper and it's around 15 inches long. And you can see 3.662, just a hair over, ready to go. What I'm going to do is carefully monitor this as it's discharging. Hopefully we can get 3 hours at 40 amps. That would equate to 120 amp hours. While the test is being performed, I'm going to carefully monitor the temperature of the cell. Channel 1. All right, let's push on. Now we're gonna to go to channel two, on. So right now we're pulling 40 amps. Yep, both are going. It should stay around the 3.25 to 3.3 with the 40 amp load. So let's see what happens. Okay guys, we're now one hour in. You can see right over here, 20.135 amp hours. You're going to multiply that by two because there's two channels. So right now we're up to 40 amp hours. And the temperature of the cell really hasn't gone up that much. When the test started, we were right around 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 degrees Celsius. And if we take a look right now, 31.8. Okay, let's let it keep going, and we'll check one hour from now. We are now at the two hour mark, and you can see right over here, 40 amp hours times two is 80, and the voltage is 3.113 volts. Keep in mind, there is a little bit of a voltage drop across this wire here, and it amounts to 0 0.08. So what you're looking at is actually 3.8. 2 volts or very close to it. When you see the chart for the discharge curve, I'm going to have the voltage drop figured in. Let's take a look at the temperature now on the cell. Maybe another degree Celsius. So the battery temperature is very stable using a 40 amp load. Okay guys, it's now three hours and you can see we're down to 2.915. Over here, 60 amp hours times 2 is 120 amp hours. Let's take a look at the temperature of the cell to see if it increased. Oh, we're at 34C, way under the 60C limit. Any minute this is going to turn off, you'll see the red light go off and the test will be complete. Oh, test complete. As you can see, the tested capacity came in at 125.6 amp hours, and that exceeds the manufacturer's rating of 120 amp hours. If you look at the discharge curve, you can see once it dropped to 3.25 volts after 15 minutes, that level of voltage was fairly consistent over a two hour period, and then it started to speed up a little bit more to the downside. And you can see once we got past three hours, it dropped off very quickly down to 2.5. What I'm going to do next is charge this back up to 3.65 volts. And I'm going to take the other three cells and charge them up to 3.65 as well. Then we're going to connect all four together to make a 12 volt battery. Right here, you're looking at the completed 12 volt lithium iron phosphate battery. Each one of the cells were bonded together in the correct order, negative, positive, negative, positive using two strips of 3M double stick adhesive. After that was done, I took some T-Rex tape, which is extremely strong stuff, wrapped it around the top of the cells and the bottom. You can see there's three areas where the positive and negative posts have been joined together. And in order to do that, I used the plates that were included with the cells. These are copper with a nickel plating. If you do not have these, you can also take a half inch type K or type L, copper pipe, cut it into three inch sections, hammer it flat, and then drill two holes. It'll be just as good. 
You can also go to a hobby shop and pick up a flat brass bar like you see right here. And that's what you see right over here connecting into the breaker. The 4S 12 volt BMS that I used is a 100 amp continuous rating and you can charge up to 50 amps. Over here it says common port. That means you're going to be charging and using the power from the lithium iron phosphate battery between the same two wires, negative and positive. The BMS is bonded to the side of the cells using the same 3M double stick adhesive along with some silicone sealant. If you look at the connector on the BMS, you're going to see the black wire for the negative post, followed by four more red wires. The red wire on the opposite end connects to the positive post. The red wire that's located right next to the black wire or the negative goes to the opposite side over here. I stripped the wire, inserted it between the two plates, and then clamped it down. The next red wire heading down the connector goes right over here, and then the third red wire goes back here, and the fourth one, which is the very bottom of the connector, goes to the positive post. The wire size is 4 gauge stranded copper. Even though this BMS has a 100 amp continuous current rating, you can go higher, but only for short durations. The BMS also has built-in overcurrent protection, but I think it only kicks in around 250 or 300 amps. So what I wanted to do was protect this from even seeing that level of current. And to do that, I added a 200 amp circuit breaker. It's very easy to set and reset. This is also bonded to the case using silicone sealant and the 3M double stick adhesive. Extremely secure, it's not going anywhere. Now that the 12 volt battery is put together, I'd like to do one more test. I have this power inverter. I want to see if I place a much heavier load on the battery, what the voltage is going to drop to. So using this 750 watt power inverter and that hair dryer, I can have this pull right around 825 to 830 watts. If you divide that by the voltage at the post of the rear of the inverter, you're going to get a certain number. And then when you divide that number by the efficiency of the power inverter, in this case around 85%, that means the hair dryer is going to be pulling right around 75 amps from this BMS. And I want to let it run for about five or 10 minutes to get the voltage to drop to a level where it's going to level off. Once the voltage is leveled off, while this is still connected to the hair dryer, I'm going to take this 100 amp load tester, connect it directly to the battery posts, then I'm going to turn on the switch for the load tester and see how much lower the voltage is going to be pulled down by adding the additional 100 amp load. So we'll be pulling 175 amps of current off that battery. The load tester is only going to be triggered for about 10 seconds and then I'm going to turn it off and we'll see how well the voltage recovers from that 100 amp load. This says 14.2 and Okay, so as you saw, the voltage dropped to a certain level. I added the 100 amps and it only pulled it down just a little bit more. I was impressed. I thought it would actually drop much lower, having 100 plus the 75 pulling on that battery. And then you can see once I took the 100 amp load off, the voltage climbed back up very close to where it was before I added the load. And guys, that is it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to rate thumbs up share, and check out my extensive video playlist for many other videos of interest to you. Thank you very much for watching.